Hi, my name is Kathy. I've been attending Family Church for two years. When I moved here, my life was kind of a wreck and took me a while to get to know people. I joined a life group and with Heather and Colleen and the three of us went through friend to friend. I was at a point in my life that I knew I needed more. I knew I, I, knew I needed to rely on God that um, he had been faithful to this point and I knew he would continue to be faithful. Going through friend to friend for the first time in many years, I truly felt and realized what it meant to be in Christ, to be a child of God. You know, he has, he has called me, he has chosen me. I am his masterpiece and he is continuing to work on me. My story, he's still writing my story. And to me, that's really cool. The other thing that I learned in Friend to Friend is to always rely on, the, on truth, God's truth. That it's easy to get sucked into worldly things and to look at disappointments or people saying things or what's going through your mind. And I really need to, to correct myself and realize that that's not God's truth. I need to focus on God's truth. The other thing that was really cool to me was the relationships that were formed through friend to friend. Uh, we were already friends, but that accountability, knowing that they were praying for me, I was praying for them, we could talk about what was going on, what was truly on our hearts, was an incredible feeling to know that they were there for me. My hope would be that someday that I could take someone through this study and bless them the way that I was blessed. Earlier this year, there was a letter that was sold for $9,000. It was a letter written to George Fisher. You know who George Fisher is? Me either. Uh, the contents of the letter was about needing two horses to cross a river. $9,000 for meaninglessness. What, what on earth? And then you realize why. It's the person who sent the letter that made it valuable. It was Alexander Hamilton, and it was from 1781. And suddenly you go, oh, $9,000, that makes sense. I was thinking about this. We're going to look at a letter today. It doesn't matter who wrote it or who received it. The contents, which are two, almost 2,000 years old, can absolutely transform our lives because it's about how we relate to hurt places in our life, relating to other people. And this is what we'll be looking at. So what I want you to do is, if you have that outline, I want you to take a pen and at the top of that uh, paper, I want you to write down the name of the hardest person for you in your life. You might be sitting next to them. Don't worry, they're writing your name down too. Go ahead, you know, you're both there. You, like, you don't know it, come on. You both are fully aware of what's going on. What would it look like if every person at every campus this week healed a broken relationship and leaned in and became close in a place they hadn't before? What would it look like in our community, in our neighborhood, in our life, in our workplace, if broken relationships found ways to healing? So we're going to look at a story called Philemon. You can turn in your Bible to Philemon. If you're looking for it, it's one page. It's a third of a page. So this is not going to be easy to find. It's a little scavenger hunt for you. A little hint. There's a thing called the table of contents at the beginning of your Bible. It starts with a P. It's right before the book of Hebrews. You're going to want to turn there because there's some things you're going to want to circle and underline. You're going to want to take some notes on it. I do want to give you a little background on this story. There are three key characters. One of them is probably the most well-known of all of them. He's the Apostle Paul. He's a leader of the church. Um, and he knows both of the other two characters in a very roundabout way. The second character is one of the least known characters in the Bible. His name is Onesimus. He is a runaway slave. Here's the funny thing about it. Onesimus means useful. You know when a slave is not useful? When they run away, so here's the, the irony of his, of his name there is, hey, I'm the useful one, I'm out, and he's gone. Interestingly enough, Philemon is his former owner. He is the host of a church in a town called Colossae. And if you know a little bit about the Bible, there's a book called Colossians. I'm fine. That actually happened in his home. So these three characters are all going to intersect. So before we move on, though, I need to talk with you about a perspective on a certain key word that in our context, because we're Americans, we come from a very different view. 
Because when we say this word in America, it means a certain thing. When I say the word slavery, this is what we think of. We think of degradation. We think of racism. We think of a horrible blight upon our past. We think of the Civil War. We think of racism that is still tearing our nation apart today. And what I want you to do is I need you to be able to, to take the lens of an American off. And I need you to back up, and you have to see this from a Roman world, from antiquity. Because how you became a slave was not because you were an African-American. You became a slave for different reasons. So I want you to understand that. Because the Bible doesn't say slavery is wrong, partly because the slavery that they were talking about was not the kind of despicable nature that America went through. Okay, So one of the things you need to know is if you were going to be a slave, usually it was because of debt. So this is their bankruptcy policy. I owe you. Can't pay you. Now you own me. Okay, I owe... Now I'm owned. See that, how that works? The next one is their jail system. If the crime was bad enough, they just offed you. That's slang for killing. Okay, write that down. Okay. In this case, though, if the crime wasn't bad enough, you would simply become someone's slave. So their jail was ownership. And then finally, the one that's most similar to ours would be conquest. If you conquered a foreign people, and then you would take the best of their people and make them slaves. But even within that, there were rules that were very different than the way we see slavery. So as you pick up this story, we're going to talk about a runaway slave and their re-intersection and their relationship with the Apostle Paul. So to kind of get you an understanding of where we are in the world, let's look where, where we live. You are right there. Oh, well, let's take a look across the world, past the Mediterranean, right into present-day Turkey. This is where that church was. This is where Philemon lived. And his slave Onesimus, living here with him, decided that he would leave. He just didn't have permission, decided he would leave. Now, if you were a slave and you wanted to run away in antiquity, you needed to find a major city that you could hide in. The most notable one would be Rome. So scholars believe that Onesimus, when he was leaving and running away from Philemon, he went ahead and stole a large number of things that Philemon owned so that he could pay for his trip because he traveled 1,200 miles away from Colossae, back across the Mediterranean, past Greece to the biggest city, the most important city, to Rome. Now here's the irony of the situation. Guess who's in Rome at this very moment? He's not from Rome. He's, he's actually there because he's arrested in Jerusalem and he appeals to Caesar. And Paul is sent from Jerusalem to be imprisoned in Rome. While he's in Rome, he meets a young runaway slave named Onesimus. And in the process of that relationship... The Apostle Paul tells Onesimus about this great Savior and this great, this wonderful, amazing grace and tells him about Jesus Christ and how Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and how it changes everything. And Onesimus becomes a follower of Jesus. Now, remember how I said there was an intersection between Philemon, the slave owner, and Onesimus, the runaway slave? Philemon was led to Christ by none other than Paul. Oh, we got the makings for a wonderful story now, don't we? Because Paul, in relationship with Onesimus, says, there's a brokenness in your relationship. You need to make it right. And so Paul says to, Philemon, or says to Onesimus, you need to go home. And so he writes a letter. The letter that you have is the letter to the slave owner carried, carried by the former slave about his runaway and about the grace of Jesus Christ, about how you handle brokenness in relationship. And when we come today, we came broken. There's not a person in here that hasn't been broken in relationship. What would it look like if we found healing and moved towards that? What if forgiveness and grace became a part of our broken places? The story starts with Paul saying, not the story, the letter starts with him saying who he is. Hey, it's me, Paul. And then the first uh, few verses, verses four through seven, he talks about what a great thing it is to be in relationship with, uh, with Philemon, how Philemon, his, his love and his faith, that he's a brother in Christ and how encouraging it is to see all that's happening because of Philemon's faith. And then in verse eight, he says, we have an issue and we want to address it. This is, we're going to have this up on the screen for you, but follow along. There's going to be some things you're going to want to mark in your Bible. Make sure you got a pen out. You're going to want to mark a couple of these verses. Therefore, although in Christ, remember this is the Apostle Paul to the host of a church in, in Colossae saying, let's deal with this slave issue. Therefore, although I, in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. I have the authority to order, mark that word, 
But instead of ordering, I want to, let, let's get down with an appeal. I want you to hear from my heart, and I want this to be your choice. Orders, there's no choice. Appeal, it's up to you. It is none other than, than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you. Well, do you remember his name? Onesimus means useful. Remember, when's the slave not? He's actually saying, when you had him, when you owned him, he wasn't useful to you. I don't care how many dishes he could wash, how many toilets he could scrub, how much farming he could do. Usefulness was nothing. In the economic terms are going to invert right now. He was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep, keep, um, keep him here with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back forever. Yeah, you owned him for a lifetime. Now you can have something greater than that. How about eternity between the two of you? Look at his now. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave. What's better than a slave? A brother. An eternal brother. You see, a brother is a relationship. A slave is an economic situation. As he goes on, he is very dear to me and even dear to you, whether you know it or not, he's dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done, any, done you any wrong or owes you anything, remember all that money that scholars believe he stole to travel the 1,200 miles? Charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Now, how do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you remember that, that conversation about sin and Jesus on the road to Damascus and how he rose from the dead? Do you remember that? Remember that? Yeah, he owes you. Don't forget there's a debt far deeper than that. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Now, here's an interesting little thing about this. We never see the response of Philemon, and we don't, see any, we don't get to see the story, the conversation that Onesimus and, and Paul have. But we do get to see an important part and, and some, some components of relationship that I want us to lean into. The first thing that I want you to notice is how the apostle Paul handles this. The first thing that I see in him is that he's willing to challenge. Write the word challenge. And then next, I want you to put the, the word Paul. You'll see this with him. You realize that in this broken relationship, Paul is not any either part of the brokenness. We've been using this idea of uh, kintsuki, which is the, it's, a, it's a, a Japanese art form that originally came because when something broke, they wanted to mend it. It became an art form because not just mending it, listen to this, and making it useful, they used gold in the glue to make it art. You know, now listen to this. Sometimes the brokenness that we have to deal with in relationships, we're not even a part of. Paul didn't do anything to Philemon. And Paul didn't do anything to Onesimus. The break is between them, and yet he's willing to challenge, and he challenges both. Okay? Onesimus becomes a follower of Jesus. I wonder what that conversation was like. Did it take four or five conversations? Or was it, hey, I think you need to go back? <laughs> that sounds great. I don't think so. I think it takes some time to process. But somewhere along the line, the challenge stuck and Onesimus went. But look at Paul's willingness to challenge. He also leans in with Philemon. Now, one of the things I, I need to talk with you about is the immediate thing that you're feeling right now when we talk about hard relationships and challenging or, or leaning in and saying, hey, there's a problem between us. For some, that is absolute terror. The worst words you ever heard when you were in high school and your, your girlfriend said, hey, we need to talk. That's bad news, by the way. If you're in high school and you haven't had a girl say that, <laughs> it's coming. At some point in your life, it's coming. The idea being, though, when you see something in there and the idea that you have to lean in, you may want to avoid. In fact, when I look at this, this is what it reminds me of. It reminds me of hospitals. Raise your hand if you like hospitals. Actually, just a little side note. I love Mercy Medical for two reasons. One, I'm there a lot. Um, I'm there partly because I'm a chaplain and because I'm a pastor, and also I do stupid stuff. 
So I, I love, and especially I love the ER because they have great doctors and they have great nurses and the receptionists care about us. I love going there. I would rather go visit people, but oftentimes I fall down or I cut my fingers or I, you know, I do stupid stuff, but I just absolutely love it. But here's what's funny. Raise your hand if you actually, in the other side, avoid hospitals. Mm-hmm, yeah. Why? Well, the reason you avoid them is because there's something scary about going in there and having them do something. And so here's what I want you to see. I want us to look at this idea of there's a brokenness between the relationship as a tumor. Now, if you have a tumor, where should you probably go? Some of you are going to avoid that, right? If you have a problem in a relationship, what should you probably do? Deal with the relationship, right? So for some, I want to challenge you. If you're an avoider of conflict, you're only letting it fester. And, and here's part of it. If you were going to have surgery on the tumor, you know the first thing that the doctor has to do? They have to cut the skin. The skin's not the problem. What do you need to do with the skin? But to get to the, the tumor, what do you have to do? You got to cut through the skin. And here's what sometimes our thinking is. When you look at the relationship and it's broken and you think, I don't want to go to them because if I go to them, I'll, I might hurt them. It's a tumor. I don't want to go to the doctor. They might cut my skin. You got a tumor. You got to do something about it. So for some of you that you're avoiders, you got to go have the conversation. Whether or not it's the brokenness is between you, sometimes you're outside and you need to say, I see this, and if you don't deal with this, this is going to kill the two of you. It's going to kill the relationship. Sometimes you're, the out, you're like Paul in that. Some of you, you're not avoiders. Um, you are willing to confront anybody about anything. But the problem is the way that you deal with tumors is you grab a cleaver and you start whacking. You are a, you're a cleaver whacker, all right? You see a tumor, and what's sad is when the relationship's broken and you got to have the conversation, people leave and they've lost other appendages. The tumor was on the arm, but they lost their left pinky toe. Why? Because you're just hacking away. When you get in there... This is, this is a good indication that when you have a, a, a relationship problem, if you're a, a cleaver whacker, you are the type of person who, number one, you do character assassination, and you're this, and you're this, and you're this. Wow, doesn't that sound healing? We have a problem in a tumor. I know I'll call you names. When I used to be a kid's pastor, I was... Um, hanging out down at, uh, at East School, East uh, Primary, and uh, one of the, the people that works there, uh, Pam Holland, came up to me, and she said, hey, I had the funniest thing. This kid came up to me and said, that other kid called me the E word. She was like, what's the E word? And the kid said, idiot. <laughs> if you're in a fight and you're using the E word, one, learn to spell. Two, you're not making it healthy. The other thing that you'll find, you might call names, you'll do character assassination. The other thing is you'll blame. Oh, blame feels good. It just doesn't heal anything. As long as blame is the center part of trying to solve relational problems, oh, what if we could just get them to take all the responsibility? Does that make it whole and healed? No. No, no. Notice the difference between someone who avoids the tumor, someone who uses a cleaver, and someone who's a surgeon. Uh, I told you I have friends at, um, at Mercy, so I got an actual scalpel. I, I don't open it because I might end up in the ER, but <laughs> it's a nice little plastic cover on it. But think of the difference between a surgeon who knows the problem, and instead of whacking away with a meat cleaver, cuts only what's needed to get in and solve the problem. One of the cool advances in surgery recently has been a move from open heart surgery. Think about this, there's a problem with the heart. We'll cut through the skin from the neck all the way down the torso. Then we're gonna take a, a, a saw blade and cut through the bone and rip it open. Before we ever get to the problem, we've ripped the body apart. Think of the, the response time or the healing time for that. Now they can do it orthoscopically where they can make a small slit and go in, find the problem, and begin to work on it. You know what I want to be relationally? I want to be someone who's a surgeon, who knows how to bring encouragement, who knows how to bring a positive, and yet be able to have the heart to tell the truth. You have a tumor, and I have to do some cutting, but I love you enough to say what needs to be said. That's what I see Paul do. You know how he starts the letter? 
in verses four through seven, he says nothing about the guy who carried the letter. He says in verse five, he talks about your faith and he says, talks about your love and all that's happening because of it. And in six, he talks about his faith and in seven, his love and he calls him his brother. He begins delicately saying, remember our relationship. And then as you look through the entire conversation, most of the wording in there is affectionate. What does he call Onesimus? He calls him my son. You're my brother. He's a spiritual son in my life. And look, look at this. Therefore, although I could be bold in order, I could use a cleaver. But I want to appeal to you on the basis of love. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. This changes everything. Look at the delicate nature of it. In your life and in your relationships, are you a surgeon or are you just whacking away? Or are you avoiding, saying, I'm not going to deal with the situation? I'm so grateful for people who are willing to love me enough to say, hey, may, we, may I, can I talk to you? I am so grateful because who would I be if they hadn't leaned in? Over the last 40 years, the 40 years I've had, the people who have been willing to say, you're not okay. This is not okay. You can't keep doing this. You're going to damage more people. I am so grateful for it. I would say this to you. For some of you, you've heard the idea of being willing to go to people. Are you willing to let people come to you and point out something that may need to be changed in your life? There's a humility there that is not comfortable. One of the things I, I see not only in Paul that he's willing to challenge these two men, that he does it with grace. I also see a willingness to obey. Do you realize Onesimus was handed a letter and said, you need to go take this to your former master. He had 1,200 miles to change his mind. He's traveling by foot. There's no 747. He can stop at any moment. At any point, he can throw the letter away and travel off on his own. But somehow that letter makes it to him and makes it to us. I uh, once was the carrier of some correspondence between my second grade teacher and my mother. You know, when you laugh and I haven't told the story yet, it's a great concern to me. <laughs> I got off the bus, it was a snowy day, and I, in all of my intelligence, realized that's white. This is white. Just throw that in the bushes. And I threw my mother's letter away, never to be seen again, until the snow melted. And my sister found the letter to Mrs. Irwin. I want you to know that when there's a three-month layoff between the time the letter was written and the time your mom gets it, there's a thing called interest that comes on your uh, consequence. I'll tell you, I paid for that. He could have done that at any point, but his willingness to obey is a testament for what God was doing in his life. You know, uh, one of the things this reminds me of, and not the sin part of this, but this reminds me of Jesus. How many times must he have wondered, should I do this? This is going to be hard. It's going to be painful. But Jesus, on his last night, he was in the garden praying, Hey, God, let's do something else. It was going to be painful for him to die on the cross, and he must have felt something so similar to what Onesimus felt. You know, we often say that the vertical rests, or the horizontal rests on the vertical. How we relate to each other is directly correlated with how we relate to God. Let me tell you something. These two things are really important, that when I relate differently to the people around me, it alters my relationship with God, and as my relationship with God grows, it alters how I relate with the people around me. Remember a couple years ago, the Holy Spirit specifically saying, you need to go tell that person what you did and make it right. To which I said, that's really stupid because that person doesn't even know and it's gonna hurt them. I, at that moment, really liked avoiding. And then the Holy Spirit said, I think you need to go make that right. And then I said, no, no, yes, no, yes. And finally he said, this is the next step in your spiritual journey. To which I was thinking, there's lots of other spiritual steps. Can't I just do this? And can't I just do that? And he said, the next step of growth is for you to trust me enough to go tell the truth. Am I willing to obey? If you play this all the way out, some of you in the room right now know that you haven't told your spouse the secret. You haven't dealt with the issue. You haven't come clean. And I would say to you, your next step in your spiritual journey is leaning in and taking care of this. What God has been whispering in your heart for years, it's time to do it. One of the things you got to see in this is that, that this is really what your relationship with Jesus is. When he calls, you may agree. Do I agree That's a good, that, that we should have truth between relationships? Yeah. 
But doing it, that's another thing. Listen to what James 1.22 says. Do not merely listen to the word, that's the Bible or what God is calling you to, what the Holy Spirit whispers in your ear, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Even, how many times do we agree with what God says and then do not do what he said? Just a little case study here for you. Raise your hand if you believe exercise will make you more healthy. Raise your hand. Good, okay. Hands down. Raise your hand if you exercise this week. Whoa. <laughs> if your hand was up the first time and you believed it would make your life better, you, why didn't you raise your hand the second time? Because what you think and what you believe and what you do are very different things, right? You may, I believe in God. Are you a follower or a believer? They are very, very, very different things. And what he calls you to, do you respond with? I mean, play this all the way out. The reason we don't exercise, because it's painful, because we don't want to. But you know what? We agree with it mentally. So we'll spend $1,200 on some sort of exercise equipment. Then one year later, post, hey, exercise equipment for sale, $75. I want this out of my garage. But all of us will raise our hand to say, my life would be better if I exercised. We'll agree. This part is much more difficult. Do you oh, actually obey? And the final thing that I see in this, I see from Philemon himself, a willingness to forgive. Here's the irony of it. I know Onesimus obeyed because the letter got to him. But we don't see any correspondence back from Philemon to Paul. So how do I know that Philemon actually obeyed and he forgave? How do I know? Because the letter made it into the Bible. Because here's what you do if you are not willing to. (laughs) But instead, he takes the letter and it actually circulates. Stop and think about it. This is a private correspondence that is then read to all of the church at Colossae. Then it is read by other churches. And then at the can- when they canonized the scripture and said, what, what letters should be in there? What ones exemplify Jesus? What ones exemplify doctrine that we hold to as a, as, a, as a church? This one makes it in. I believe Philemon forgave. Otherwise, this is really an embarrassing service for him because he was told to forgive. I think he forgave. And here's what's interesting about this. Um, much like exercise, if I say How many of you believe life would be better if we forgave? We'd all raise our hand. But forgiving is one of the most heartbreaking, difficult things you'll ever do. I want to walk through a process and acknowledge the fact that your heart is broken, and they did it, and how we handle that. The first thing that I want you to see is that it's a process. And the first step in that is to forgive. And this is when you come to that acknowledging, okay, I'll forgive. You may even say it to them. I forgive you. But then there's a problem because the next day you're driving in your car and they come to mind. And now all that forgiveness that you thought you had, you really just want to punch them in the face again. And then the next day you're in the shower and you remember and then you just can't stand them. And then they walk by you and they think everything's fine. How do they, why do, what gives them the right to think everything's fine? Don't you remember what you did? Now remember, I said I forgave, but the middle part's the hard part. And this is why it's so critical that you understand this principle. You make a choice to forgive, it's a decision. But you may spend years or decades going through the next part. Because you forgive as a decision, but forgiving is a process where I remember what they did and I forgive. And then you know what the next step is? Remembering what they did, and I forgive. And I remember what they did, and I forgive. The decision's the beginning of it, and then a process. And if you're in the middle of this, it may seem like an eternity to get there. But if you continue and persist in the idea of I forgive, and I forgive, and I hold nothing against you, I forgive, that someday you may find yourself here. You see, the first part is a decision, then it's a process, then it's freedom. I do want to give a caution. When we say forgive, we are talking about your heart in relationship to them and with Jesus. First with Jesus and then with them. But I want you to understand, if this is an abusive situation, forgiveness is not the same thing as handing trust back to them. Scripture never says that. If someone is abusive, you need to get help. 
You need to forgive, but that does not mean you place yourself under that abuse again. Please hear me on that. But as you go through this, what you'll have to do is you'll have to move sometimes very slowly, processing it. When they're far away, it's more difficult. And I would say this too. Sometimes the person that you write down on your outline, the one you're struggling with, is no longer with us. The process still matters. And you can't go to them and say it, but that part of your heart that's broken because of what they did, even if it was years ago, has to be processed out. One of the things that you'll need to see, the first step in this is that you'll have to make the understanding of what they owe. I would suggest actually when you look at this, you would make a list of what they've done. Case in point, just understanding for you that forgiveness is actually an economic term. So let's play this out. This is Pastor Craig. Let's say Craig needs a loan for a dollar. I give him the loan, okay? Now understand, he owes me, and that's enough. He owes me now. You follow this? We've made an agreement. He owes me. Economically speaking, we didn't write it down, but all of you saw it. It's on video. I loaned him a dollar. He owes me what? A dollar. I understand. Yeah, we'll do some interest on this one. I like the sound of... Amen to you over here. <laughs> the part of this that I need you to hear, though, is that economically, he has to give me back unless I forego what he owes. Forgiveness is letting go of what, I, what he owes. So if I were to forgive him, which I don't, <laughs> he would not have to pay me back the dollar. And so here's the process for you. You write down what they owe. They owe you respect, and they owe you an apology, and they shouldn't have done that, and you write down the brokenness in your heart that came from what they did. And then as time goes by, you try and say, I forgive, and you cross it out. It's one of the most painful checklists you'll ever struggle through in your life. You know, Saturday morning when you make the checklist of all the things you need to get done, this is the kind that will take all of your emotional and spiritual fortitude. This is where Jesus will be necessary, where you look at it and then you can cross it off. The other thing that I see in this is you have to not only discuss what they owe, but what do I owe? See, this idea of my relationship with people rests on my relationship with Jesus. Let's go back to the beginning of the service if you don't know me, here's something you need to know about me. I'm a sinner who deserves hell. Because what I owe, I cannot pay. In fact, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. The price for my choices is that I deserve to die. I deserve hell. I deserve to be distant from God. That is what I have earned. And that is what you have earned. Romans 6.23 is the most disgusting, horrible, heartbreaking verse except that there's a second half to it. Because then there's a conjunction that says, but. Because the score is, we all stink and deserve hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so not only do I acknowledge what they owe, I have to come first with this. I don't deserve it either. And when I remember what I owe and forgiveness that comes from Jesus, it changes the way you relate with them. One of the things I'd like you to do, and this is a challenge in your devotions this week, we're going to be looking at the book of Philemon and also the book of Colossians, the two books that, the letters that uh, young Onesimus carried. When you're doing it, here's what I'd like you to look for. Uh, this is an assignment. And if you're reading it some other place, I want you to look for all the places that something in the text reminds you of Jesus. That Onesimus went reminds me of Jesus in the garden. The discussion about Forgiveness reminds me how Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. I want you to look at the characters and say, what in their actions reminded me of Jesus? Because ultimately forgiveness begins and ends with me and the cross. And then it just plays out with other people. Got a couple challenges I want to um, give you as we move forward. Things that I want you to process this week. The first one is I want you to acknowledge the hurts. This is to call the tumor the tumor. To say... Here's what's wrong, and here's how I'm hurt. And then you also have to do this. You have, have to acknowledge their hurts, which takes some humility. And then you have to own your part. Confess your sins. This may be that part where you are 
you're obeying in that difficult space where Jesus said, I want you to go tell the truth. Then you go tell the truth. And finally, on the other side, I want you to begin the process. And I know you're going to write down, forgive the hurt. Can you write down below that, for, begin the process? And for those of you who are in the middle of it, and you've never heard that it's a process and you feel broken, I want you to know this is how it goes. It does take time. Forgiving is hard work. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you that as a broken person, you've taken that beautiful gold glue and you're putting me back together. God, I pray personally for the places where I have hurt people. I pray that you would bring that grace and that mercy in and you would restore what I have broken. And God, I pray for us as a people that you would look at the name we've written at the top of our outline and you would honestly move us to a, a deeper place where healing can happen. Grateful for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.